so I give it all, give it all, give it all, give it all to you. And I give it all, give it all, give it all, give it all to you, to you, to you. Father, we give it all to you. We give our lives to you. But as we sing, hands held high, I surrender, Lord, that we would surrender to you in our lives, Jesus, because you're so much more than we could ever hope for. Lord, you are everything that we need. And we shouldn't want for anything, Lord. We praise you. We give this morning to you as we get into your word and learn more about um, who you are and your love for us. We praise you and we thank you. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Go ahead and say good morning to those around you. Good morning, ladies. I'm very excited to be here. I don't know about you, but I'm very excited about this study. Um, there is a lot of good stuff in this study. And needless to say, way too much stuff to try and fit into a teaching, even though the uh, chapter... The section that we have this morning is only seven verses. It is full. So let's pray and get started. Father God in heaven, we just rejoice in this beautiful day that you've given us. Lord, I thank you for these ladies who are eager to be in your word and eager for fellowship with one another. Father, we do ask that your Holy Spirit would reign uh, this morning in our hearts and in our minds and that we would be in tune to your spirit. And we ask that you'd bless our time together in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are looking at the Ephesus church this morning, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. And as we begin this study in the churches uh, in the book of Revelation, there are two views that dominate. One is called the futuristic interpretation, and you don't need to write this down. It's just kind of some background information. The futuristic interpretation states the seven churches represent stages of church history, with the Ephesus church being what they call the apostolic stage, which also included a prophetic view as well as believing that the messages can be applied to conditions today in churches. The second view, the other interpretation, is that of historical, which says that these seven churches are actual churches that John wrote to, and they also represent churches literally of every age of church history. So in other words, even though they were actual churches, the message to those churches is relevant for all churches in church history. And so um, we are to study them to identify our own situations and listen to what Jesus is saying to us. So either way, whichever view you happen to take, there's still a message for the church and for us as individuals in the church. Each church, as we study them, will reveal strengths, and weaknesses, challenges, and warnings, and problems from within the church as well as from without. What is common among all seven churches is the message is from Jesus himself. Jesus knew them, and he knew their works, and he gives each of them a promise and an admonishment. So we can ask as we study these letters, what does this passage say of Jesus and our relationship to him? What is Jesus saying to the church today through them? And what is he saying to each of us as individuals within the church? So we're going to look at the city of Ephesus first, just to give you some background so you can better understand this church and the message that Jesus gives to them. Ephesus is located in Asia Minor. And it was a very, very important city. It was the capital of the Roman province and the home of the Roman governor in Asia. The city was quite large in Paul's day, and I was very surprised to read what they estimate the population to be between 200,000 and 350,000. That's a very large city. I just don't picture cities being that big back in those days, right? It was a commercial center, and it was a seaport on the Aegean Sea. And it was connected also by many highways to the various trade routes. So that's what made this an important city. And because of these things, because of the tr being a seaport and a trade center, a commercial center, it was a very wealthy city. 
It was very, very well known at the time as the center of worship for Artemis or Diana, as she is known, the goddess of fertility. In fact, there was a very large temple built in Ephesus and people from all over the area would come there to worship, but they would also come there basically like a tourist, you know, to come to how we go to places and look at them and people in that time also did that with the temple. In fact, that temple became known as one of the wonders of the ancient world. This temple, because of its size and because of um, all of the people that came there and, and had to give, it also was wealthy and became a treasury for the banks to make loans. There were many tradesmen, innkeepers, and food establishments that thrived there due to the people that came to the temple itself to worship and see the temple. Ephesus is in the area of what we now uh, is known as Western Turkey. We read of Paul visiting Ephesus uh, during his second missionary journey, and he leaves Aquila and Priscilla behind to uh, work in his absence initially. In fact, they began a home church, we read about in Romans 16, 3 through 5, Aquila and Priscilla. So the church initially met in their home. Then Paul spends nearly three years in this city spreading the gospel, bringing many to Christ during his third missionary journey. And at that time, Paul leaves behind Timothy to oversee the church in Ephesus, which we can read in 1 Timothy 1.3. It's also said, I thought this was interesting, it's also said that John, the Apostle John, the beloved one, the one who has this vision that we're reading about in the book of Revelation, also lived in and ministered in Ephesus for many, many years. And it was from here, from the city of Ephesus, that he was exiled to the island of Patmos for his um, spreading of the gospel, his preaching, his testimony of Christ. Historically, this church was made up of mostly Gentile Christians. It eventually became a church that, was, that grew and had much influence. Acts 19.20 says, So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. And prevailed just means to be strong and powerful. Now, I know you haven't worked your way ahead yet in any of the other lessons, but you'll notice as you do that as we study these churches, there is a pattern to each message, it will always begin with Jesus, with Jesus giving a description of himself. Then Jesus will give a commendation. In other words, he's going to point out the good things that he knows about that church, their positive characteristics, their positive actions. But he will also include a rebuke or exhortation of things that they should not be doing, of their deficiencies and their weaknesses. And then he will finish his message with a promise. In all but one of the letters, Jesus refers to himself by one of the terms that we initially read about that describes him in chapter one. I think that's really cool too. So let's look at this letter's message by the pattern that we see in each letter. The first is the description of Jesus. Notice that Jesus refers to himself in the beginning of this letter as he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and remember, right hand always speaks of power, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And we find this reference to Jesus in chapter one, verse 16. It says he holds the seven stars, and holds means to be strong, mighty, to hold fast and to hold firmly. And so it speaks of Jesus' ultimate power and authority over the church and his servants. This description also speaks of his omniscience and his omnipresence. The fact that we read that Jesus walks in the midst of these seven golden lampstands speaks of his presence among us, the church. Christ then, seen in his proper role as the one who rules over the church, who guides it, and is, in, is to be in the midst of it. So it says that he walks among the midst of the lampstands. And the lampstands is the Greek word that means candlestick. And it literally means a portable lamp 
or illuminator. So in other words, that light could be taken from one place to another. And so if we consider the meaning of the lampstand or candlestick, we can see that we as the church are to be the light to the world around us. Exodus 25, verse 31 to 37, gives us a description uh, of the tabernacle that was uh, to be built and the golden lampstands that were to be part of that. And those golden lampstands were used as light for the priest to do his daily work. They provided light, though, only, the golden lampstands, that is, provided light only in the holy place, which was where the presence of God was. And I just love that image of the lampstands. The world is a very dark place, and the church is to be the light of Christ that they are drawn to. Light is to dispel darkness, and if we let our light shine, it will bring illumination to others through the power of the Holy Spirit, and the light of Christ then can be revealed to others. So we're to be that light that shows forth Jesus to the world around us. We read about that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. It says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We'll get into it a little more later, but it goes down into verse 5 where he gives an exhortation, Jesus does, about these lampstands that if this exhortation is not heeded, Jesus says he will remove your lampstand from its place. So in other words, the church's influence, its light, your light, no longer would be effective because of a lack of love and disobedience, as we will read through the chapter. So the second pattern of every letter is the commendation. And as we study this church, I think it's really helpful to remember what city that this church was established in and what this church had to contend with. And as I looked into the city of Ephesus and as I read those things to you this morning, I was thinking that sounds very familiar about where we live. I'm not, I don't mean this church, but just the area in which we live. Wealthy, um, idol worship of the themselves or of, of, of sex. Just there's so many things that there's idol worship of. So I think this message is particularly pertinent for us today. So the commendations, that was a little... Kind of got a little track off track there. The commendations, I'm going to read them to you. You don't need to write them down because you've studied them and you'll have them in your lesson this week. Works, labor, it says he, they labored in his name, in Jesus' name. Patience, the fact that they tested or tried what was being said, what they heard. So in other words, they were discerning. It said that they could not bear evil and they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Not the Nicolaitans themselves, but their deeds. So two words, very similar, works and labor, are what he first commends. Both of them mean toil, but works in addition to toil, which I don't know about you, but that kind of makes me think you're working a little hard when you toil at something, right? But works also means deeds and the conduct of men. Whereas the word labor means toil, but to toil resulting in weariness. So this church was really a busy church. They were working for the Lord and they were toiling at it, right? So how does that relate to us? Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And Titus 3.8 says, This is a faithful saying, And these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. So we ladies as a church as well as individuals are called to be doing good works. And it's not like, okay, I did my good work for today and that's it or my good work in my walk when I was first a Christian and that's it. It said we're to walk in good works. We're to be careful to maintain good works. And when we look at our own church, we can observe that it is full of works and labor in the name of Jesus. But what about you and what about me? Could this be said of us? Jesus knows what we do for him. He alone is able to evaluate what we do for him as to whether it is good or bad. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. 
We're not judged for our sins, ladies, but we will stand before him and he's going to say, what did you do for me? And we need to, and then he's the one that's able to evaluate whether those were good works or whether they were not good. Remember, he can see the motive and the intent of our heart, even in the things that look good that we do. Jesus commends this church for not growing weary in the labor of his name. Hebrews 6.10 tells us, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And that what stands out to me in this verse is it says he's not unjust to forget your work and labor of love. I think that that phrase labor of love is key here based on what we're going to look at in a little bit about this particular church um, coming to that place where they did not have that love evident anymore. Patience is the next thing that Jesus commends them for. Patience means steadfastness, constancy, endurance. In the Thayer's Greek lexicon, it goes on to say this about patience. The characteristic of a man who is unwavering from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. So in other words, no matter how great the trial, how great the suffering, the person that has patience is dedicated to maintaining their faith and their piety in the Lord. We need patient endurance and steadfastness in the face of spiritual conflicts, which we are going to face. Those threats that come within the body itself and those threats that come from outside the church, but against us. 1 Thessalonians 1.3 says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, again those, that phrase, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. The next thing Jesus commends is the, um, the fact that the church of Ephesus tested those who called themselves apostles. I love that. So here comes this group of guys into the church, right? And they say, oh, I'm an apostle. But this church tested them. Test means to test for the purpose of ascertaining one's quality or what he thinks or how he will behave himself. So in other words, they looked at these men They knew what an apostle was supposed to look like, what an apostle said, what an apostle believed in. And they saw these men and their conduct and their words and said, nope. What did they call them? They said they found them to be liars. This church in Ephesus was surrounded by those who were evil, those who practiced idol worship. Those who, Paul says in Acts 20, would come in as savage wolves. So there's gonna be people just like In that church, there are savage wolves from time to time within the body of Christ that are trying to thwart the work of God. They're trying to draw people away from Christ and from the gospel. Ephesians 4.19, Paul said, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. And I was thinking about the fact that the, the church, where it was located in Ephesus, and the fact that they had idol worship and that temple there, that they possibly were trying to influence this church to lewdness, to uncleanness, and that they could have been very greedy because it was a wealthy city and they were used to that. What kind of threats come from within? 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, Paul again speaking says, now the spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, which is what this church found, and having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. So we see this church in Ephesus Definitely, Ephesus, excuse me, had threats from the outside, which would be, of course, any unbeliever and the idol worshipers, but they had threats from the inside as well. And so how relevant is that to us today, that message about um, testing and trying uh, the things that we hear? It's vital that as a church, as well as individual believers, that we understand and know that there will be false teachers bringing messages into the church that are against the word of God. Most often, it will be subtle, especially in the beginning. 
But today it seems that these messages, these false teachers, it often fits the narrative of our society and the world that we live in. It might even sound good initially, but the key is, does it line up with the scriptures? We ladies are blessed. We have an overseer of this church who preaches the word, stays true to it, and he is bold to speak out against what is false. Now, while we might not be an overseer of this church, we are a part of this church. And as such, we need to be alert to those who would seek to come in with false, perverse, deceitful things. And how can we do this? We can only do this if we know the word of God. We have to know what it says. To know what is false, you must first know what is true. Because these people that come in often bring you part of the truth, but not the whole truth. And they deceive by using part of it, right? And then the rest of it is false. So that's why it's so key for us to know the word of God. I love what Paul says in, to the leaders of this church in Ephesus in Acts 20, verse 27 to 28. He says, for I have not shunned to declare you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves. So, preaching all of the word, and that the fact that he's telling them that, they need to take heed to themselves just as we do. Paul's heart was for the furtherance of the kingdom of God, no matter the cost. And he said in verse 21 of that same chapter that he testified to the Jews and to the Greeks of repentance and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So there was no watering down of the gospel, no easy gospel, no fluff, sharing the gospel to all with boldness, discernment of what others says as it relates to instruction and to the Bible is so important. We are not to believe everything that someone says. Pastor Jack has said this, and I know that we have said this as well. Acts 17, 11, they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. You hear him say something, you hear me say something, you hear Lisa say something, you hear Shadrach say something. Just because we say it doesn't mean that you shouldn't evaluate whether it is true or not. And you should check it out yourself. It is your responsibility to do that, to find out whether what we've said is truthful. Just because someone is standing on a stage uh, in a pulpit doesn't mean that everything they say is right. So um, in 1 John 4, 1, he, uh, he says, John, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. And we're not talking about ghosts or anything like that. Spirits means teachers. So test the teachers, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. A wise and um, effective church is discerning. We all need to have discernment for what is being said. So as an individual believer in this church, how are you doing in this area? The next thing he says, as far as commending them, and it's the last one that we're gonna talk about, is that he, they couldn't tolerate evil. In verse two, Jesus' words are that you cannot bear those who are evil. And the word bear is not a word that we would probably use in that sentence, but um, just because it's kind of an old-fashioned word, but it literally just means endure. So it's, he's saying you cannot endure these evil men. And evil means base, wrong, wicked, morally in their thinking, feeling, and acting. This church in Ephesus was surrounded by evil. Remember, the temple of Diana was there. And as, as I read about that, there, this temple and many of the temples in those days were like this. Um, it was not like how we come to church here. This was a temple where there were sexual orgies. There were, was prostitution. There were sexual practices that were not natural, that were being performed. Because remember, this temple is for the goddess of fertility. So fertility, of course, has to do with sex in a way, right? And so this was just one of the evils of their day. And it sounds not too unlike our society today that is sex crazed, that is deviant in its sexual practices and thinking. 
And it, we are not to tolerate their evil, this evil, and we're not to adopt their ways of thinking, but we need to oppose it. We should not be allowing any of this kind of thinking, evil thinking, to infiltrate the church. And um, one of the things that popped into my head that I, I, it's not like, you know, Pastor Jack is saying, yeah, this is okay. That's not what I mean by this statement at all. But there are some of these types of thinking that have infiltrated the church, generally speaking. In like one of them is um, pornography. Men and women think, I mean, they're practicing it. They're doing it. They think it's okay. And so the world's thinking has infiltrated their thinking and they're calling themselves Christians. And we are not to tolerate this type of evil. We need to be like the Ephesians and take a strong stand and not tolerate it. Psalm 119 verse 104b says, therefore I hate every false way. The third pattern that we're gonna look at is that you will always find a rebuke or an admonishment in these uh, letters to the churches. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love, Revelation 2.4. Those are Jesus' words. And as I read that verse, I thought, no, so what kind of things characterize a first love? Whether it's your first love for Jesus, whether it's your first love for a, a man, you know, uh, the, your husband, um, I was thinking of fervency and constancy, anticipation, you anticipate wanting to be with them, enthusiasm, intentionality, devotion and dedication, zeal, and even being inclined toward them. So our first love with Jesus, we were really inclined toward him, right? Or if it was our husband, we were just wanted to be with them all the time. A church that has lost its first love has become indifferent they are half-hearted, their zeal is cooling off, and their hearts are drifting away from Christ. This church was still doctrinally sound. They hadn't veered from sound doctrine. But one commentator put it like this. He said they had become orthodox. They had become somewhat mechanical. And um, they had let their love of Jesus drift away. It's, it's good to remember, too, that by the time John gets this vision and writes it to the church in Ephesus, that the church that he, Paul had established in Ephesus was 40 years old. So over the years, they had continued to perform works, but they had grown colder in their love for Christ, and all of these works were no longer performed out of their love for him. I don't know about your Bible, but my Bible has a little title over every church that we will look at. And I looked at all my Bibles at home and they all had the same exact title for these seven verses, The Loveless Church. And I thought, how tragic that this is what they're being remembered for rather than, it was a long list of commendations that Jesus gives for this church, right? But the thing that stands out the most is that they had left their first love. I, as a Christian, want to be remembered for the good things, not the bad things I do. And so this is a warning to us, ladies, to not leave that first love. And so the word left means to forsake or neglect, keep no longer. And the word first means somewhat what you think it is, first, but it's for, foremost in order, in place, or importance. Can you and I honestly say that our love for Jesus is first in order, in place, and importance in our lives? Generally, to leave your first love is a gradual process. It's going to be somewhat subtle. Remember, the deeds of this church, and even our church, if this was happening here, which I don't believe it is, but the deeds of the church might be evident and they might be good, but they're done more out of duty. When the most important thing is the love and the dedication of the believers to Christ. As Christians, we can sometimes let works become more important than the relationship with Jesus, than the love that we are to have for Jesus. And we get a glimpse of this from Jesus in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42, in the story of Mary and Martha. Martha was all caught up in the doing the act of serving while Mary sat at Jesus' feet. Mary is the one that's commended. 
by Jesus with these words, but one thing is needed and Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. Mary's heart was so dedicated and so full of love for Jesus that she was like, I want as much as I can get from him. I want to just sit at his feet and just take him in and take in what he has to say. What would cause us to do that with Jesus? That is, leave our first love. What, how do we get to that place of leaving that first love? And by the way, we are not talking about loss of salvation here. That is not what this verse is speaking of. Just as with the church in Ephesus, it may not be anything bad necessarily. It can be, but it may not be anything bad that we're doing. They were still laboring in his name. But we can allow so many things in our life to crowd out Jesus. It could be our ministry, because if you're one of these people like me, you're a doer, do, 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 right? And sometimes we can neglect that time that we need to have with Jesus. It could be work. Maybe you've allowed work to become too important and take up too much time. Maybe it's relationships, that of your husband, friend, children, um, spouse. Could be just laziness. Could be the lure of the world. And I think today, this one kind of tops the list. Easy access to everything distracting from our electronic devices. How much time have we spent on this thing that we're looking at versus our time with Jesus? We can make comments and have this kind of an attitude. You know, I got up today. That's not true, but let's just say you're saying this. You get up today and it's like, oh, shoot, I don't have time. I'm not going to read. I'll do it later. But normally later never comes, right? And maybe it's day after day that you do this. Oh, it's not that big of a deal if I don't attend church in person. I'll just watch it online today. And pretty soon you're watching it online every Sunday or every Wednesday. And pretty soon you might not be watching it at all. Or maybe it's you or a family member. Well, doggone it. We have this sport we're in and there's games every Sunday for three months. It's just three months I'm going to miss church. But then I'll I'll get back to it. And often that does not happen either. How many of you know someone that decided not to attend church during the early days of COVID and has now stopped going to church altogether and no longer even watches online? I know a lot of people like that, and it grieves my heart. How many of you know someone who was so on fire when they first accepted the Lord And you wonder now if they really were saved because there's no fruit, there's no going to church, there's no talking about Jesus, there's no knowledge or understanding at all of the word of God. All relationships need work to be maintained and remain healthy. And the same is true with our relationship with Jesus. Our love for him is gonna require effort and discipline and it is a choice How much effort are you putting into your love for him? Are you choosing him above all else in your life? Jesus himself tells us in Mark 12, 30, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That means all of you, (laughs) every single aspect of you. And so when we look at this verse, I think we can better understand how one could leave their first love or at least drift a little bit away, right? Because all of us are gonna fall short of loving God with our whole being. It is something hopefully we desire to be true and we are seeking to do. A sincere love for Jesus should result from our profession of faith in him and we need to keep tending to that love. Just as you have to, have to tend to a fire, right? If you've got a fire going, whether it's at a campground or whether it's in your living room, eventually it's gonna burn down, right? But if you wanna keep it going, you have to do something to do that. You have to add more wood, you have to add kindling, you have to add some oxygen, maybe you get those little bellows, you know, to get things going. And we have to do the same thing with our relationship with the Lord. We have to tend to it. So next we move along to the rebuke that Jesus gives, along with the rebuke that he just gave about them walking away from their first love. He gives instructions and commands as to what they need to do. So three words stood out. 
in verse 5, which were remember, repent, and do. So the word remember just means to call to mind the circumstances. So you're going to be purposeful and intentional to recall the way that you once were in your love relationship with Jesus and recall the things that, let, that you let cause you to drift away so that you don't return there again. Repent is the second one that is spoken of in that verse, and that means to change one's mind or purpose. So we need to acknowledge first that we have sinned in this area, then repent of it. And repent means not to just change your mind, but it means to turn the other way. So it's going to involve an action on your part. And that third thing that he says is do. Jesus exhorts them to do the first works. So in other words, they were to perform the works that they did at first, which were done out of love for Jesus and were motivated by their love for him. Commentator Krista Maker says this, a church ceases to be a church when it no longer serves its master with genuine love and dedication. There is hard evidence that nominal Christianity dies a natural death within a generation or two and consequently disappears completely from the scene. The members may still come together but they meet for social and not spiritual purposes. How tragic if that is true in churches today. Along with these commands, there's a warning of the consequences if they don't do them. Jesus said, he will remove your lampstand from its place. And again, just a reminder, this is not speaking of your salvation or loss of it. It's speaking of the church's effectiveness. It would no longer be a light to the world around them. What good is a lampstand or a candlestick in the dark if it's not lit? So you're in this dark room and you got this beautiful golden lampstand sitting there, but you don't have it lit. Guess what? You're still in a dark room, right? If there's no light coming from it, that candlestick is doing you no good. And so what good is the church if there is no light coming from it or if Jesus is not in the midst of it? The church in Ephesus is no longer a church. This area has been overtaken by the Muslim faith. The last pattern that we'll look at very briefly is the promises that you will find in the letters. We all love happy endings, don't we ladies? And for this church, there is one if the warnings that Jesus gives are heeded. He says, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That's verse seven. Those who overcome will partake of the fullness of eternal life and the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And the paradise of God is literally the abode of God. It's where God himself dwells. This tree of life, according to Revelation 22, one through four, will be present in the new Jerusalem and we will partake of its life-giving fruit forever and have forever fellowship with Jesus. I love how each of these letters to the churches begins and ends. Jesus begins the words to the churches in each letter, and then he exhorts us at the end of each letter with these words. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And of course, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. This should get our attention, right? Jesus' words at the beginning, Holy Spirit reminder at the end, right? Right? These messages have spiritual implications that are relevant to all of us, no matter where we are in our walks with the Lord or no matter what church we attend. In the Greek language, the first part of this phrase, he who has an ear, refers to the capability of a person to hear and their willingness to listen. Okay, so it says, he who has an ear. So are you capable of hearing? and then your willingness to listen. The second part, the let him hear what the Spirit says, is a command to listen attentively and 
obediently to the words of the Holy Spirit. I was reminded of chapter 1, verse 3, which told us, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So this might be a good time, ladies, for us to examine how well we actually listen to Jesus and what he tells us. And of course, the best way to hear what he says is in this book right here. It's the word. And we would do well to understand and heed the message that's given to each church as it applies to our own specific life. For when we do, it says, we will be blessed. So what again is that message to the church of Ephesus? Labor for Jesus' name. Do works. Patiently endure. Don't tolerate evil. Test the things that people say, teachers, what they say. Maintain your first love. And then remember, repent, and do. Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. Even though we might think this book of Revelation is not for us, we find that the messages for these, uh, that you gave for these seven churches are completely applicable to us today. Father, keep us from the th negative things that you will say about these churches, particularly this church where you said that they had left their first love. Lord, may that never be true of any of us in this room. Father, stir up that love within our hearts, Lord. As the name of this study says, rekindle the fire, Lord, uh, of that love and desire and dedication in our hearts to you. And help us to be women that hear what the Spirit says, but then do what the Spirit says to us. Lord, I pray you'd bless these ladies as they go forth to their small groups and, and home, that you would um, just guide them, you'd keep them safe, and that you would bless their day in Jesus' name. Amen.